Uh, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Great to see you all again. Uh, so we've heard lots already today, lots of great insights about uh, benefit strategies and how they're shifting in order to engage, uh, to educate, and to enable employees. Uh, we're seeing how how this is moving so that uh, so that your benefit strategies are linking more closely to employee well-being. But what I'd like to do for the next 15 minutes or so is just take a, a little change of focus, um, if you will. And so instead of looking at all these great innovations and new developments that are coming uh, down the path, um, let's actually look at what already exists. So let's look at, at what's already in place and see how we can improve that. I had a meeting a few weeks back, a couple of months ago actually, with uh, the, the managing director of a financial services organisation. Uh, and he was talking about trying to engage with his staff about, about pensions and benefits. Uh, and he came up with this, this gem uh, of a phrase. I've up my pension contributions, now up yours. Um, for some people, that was a little bit too direct, and I'm not quite sure how that resonated with your employees, but you probably understand the, uh, the sentiment, the meaning that he was, he was getting at in, in, in his comment. And, and I think that's, that's an absolutely perfectly rational call to arms. We need to do more. You know, pensions is difficult. You know, we've got legislation that's, that's constantly shifting. The sands beneath us are always changing. Uh, and, and not just moving, but being layered on top uh, ev ever and ever more, which makes it in incredibly difficult to know what we should be doing and for whom we should be doing it. Uh, particularly when you look at the whom. You know, we've, we've spoken a lot today about, about personalization. Uh, and, and no matter which organization you, you're representing or working for here today, no matter how niche or specialized perhaps you think you are, beneath all of that, your employees will be a hugely varied group of people. And as a consequence of that, they will all have a hugely varied set of outcomes that, that they will be targeting. Um, and we got an, an illustration of that when we look at, at seven friends. So we break it down into seven different people and we look at just how different they all are. So the first one we have is a guy called Doc. Now Doc's got some pretty crazy theories about the future, but he's been a long-standing member of the NHS pension scheme. He's saved pretty hard himself. And so now for him, his issue is things like the annual allowance and the lifetime allowance. Can he save more into a pension scheme? We've got his friend, Grumpy. Now, Grumpy is the kind of guy who's pretty jaundiced, pretty suspicious when it comes to pension schemes. He works in an industry where there's a very high turnover of staff. Job security is pretty rubbish. Um, even in his last role, um, he wasn't there long enough to even be automatically enrolled. He didn't make it past the <laughs> postponement period. We then have Happy, who smiles about everything. He's a very lucky fella. He's a member of multiple pension schemes. He's got great contributions going into those schemes. Um, his objectives are very different. You know, he's looking at retirement as a very real factor. He's just got a couple of projects that he wants to finish first before he walks away. <laughs> and then we get Sleepy, who's made some dreadful decisions about pensions in the past, um, to such an extent that he's going to have to work for much, much longer than his uh, state pension age. And talking of dreadful decisions, we've got Dopey. Dopey was really lucky. He had a fantastic defined benefit pension scheme but cashed out and invested it in a pineapple canning factory in the Zambia and is now wondering what's happened to that investment advisor who gave him that guidance for that great investment opportunity. Last couple to address, um, for, uh, second to last, is, is Sneezy. Now, Sneezy's got plenty to think about, plenty to do. Now, he's, uh, he's, he's in that position of knowing that actually in his family, longevity is something that he really needs to give some serious thought to. He's hoping at some point in the not-too-distant future that he'll get that long-awaited promotion. And, and there's also the chance for some inheritance along the track. So there's lots of different elements that he's got to, to factor in. And last but not least, we've got Bashful. Now, he's got a pretty small pension. <laughs> he's not quite sure what he should do with it. He's not quite sure where it should go. And he's, he's too shy to ask. So joking aside, uh, this comes back to the point that we've raised a few times already today, that everyone is different. Everyone has different expectations, different outcomes, different requirements. So we can't have a one-size-fits-all strategy. What you need to do in order to make pension schemes work is to make them as efficient as possible, to contribute for as long as you possibly can, and then to get employees and employers to pay more in. Pretty straightforward. So taking each of those in turn... Making it as efficient as possible, well, what you need to do is look at the underlying factors. You need to look at, yes, things like administration to make sure that your, your scheme is resonating with your staff, that they're engaging in their understanding. But, but these factors, charges, performance and volatility, are absolutely fundamental, absolutely key to making sure that the pension scheme will work. 
And so to illustrate this, I've got an example that will run through the course of the next five or ten minutes. This is a, an example employee. We'll, we'll call him Jack. Jack's joined the scheme at 25. He's got a salary of £25,000, and his company contribution rate gives him 8% going into the, to the scheme a year in total. Uh, he's planning on taking his benefits age 68, which he knows to be his current state pension age. He's got increases of salary, we're projecting of 2% every year, and we're projecting uh, investment growth of 4% per year. The charge deducted for his pension scheme is 0.75%, in line with the auto-enrollment cap. So what does that mean in reality? Well, when he gets to age 68, uh, in today's terms, his pension pot will be worth somewhere in the region of £265,000. So charge first. What happens if we reduce the charge? What happens if we reduce the charge by as much as a third, down to 0.5%? Well, actually, the impact is pretty small. We add about £16,000 onto Jack's pension policy. We're not making a huge difference here, so we need to look at some of the other options in terms of trying to make his pension scheme work. If we look, for instance, at the provider market, uh, the providers that many of you will probably be saving with, they will all have their own default investment options they will put forward. And they will position these default investment options as, as a stable option, as a solid option, as, as something that will suit the majority of your workforce. We've designed it as such and let it be so. But actually, if you look in detail at these, these different default investment options, they're wildly different. They do hugely different things and they have massively different... Uh, uh, targets and, 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 and intentions. So we did some research. We looked at, at each of these companies in a bit more detail to see exactly what's going on und, under the bonnet, if you will. Uh, and we looked at asset classes to start with. And the asset classes change massively. So if we just take equity exposure, stocks and shares exposure, you can see that across these supposedly, as far as a member will be concerned, broadly similar default investment options, there's massive differences. As much as 85% exposure to stocks and shares in some default options and as little as a third in others. So huge vagaries, huge differences. The same is true when we then layer in bonds. Yeah, each of these invests a different amount in bonds and, and, and you know, whether the member understands this or not is, is, is probably very unlikely. Uh, but we are seeing massive differences. You then add in things uh, like commodities, hedges and property and again we see a, a very, very different approach to what these are actually achieving, what these are delivering. And that's crucial, because some of these are very aggressive, some of these are very conservative. And actually, uh, what we see through the evidence is the, the aggression that some of these funds take isn't always rewarded in the same way with the returns that the member might expect to see. So it's not unusual to see differences. We would expect these companies to, to have their own strategies, their own take uh, on, on investment options, but it's important that you understand what the target is, how much risk is being taken, how much return is being taken, in order to make sure that the pension scheme works. So let's look at fund performance and see how that affects Jack's overall outcome. So we're back at the starting point of £265,000 uh, as, as his target pot. Well, if we add an extra half a percent return per year, so we're bumping it up now to 4.5%, where does that get Jack? It gets him an extra £33,000 in his pension pot. Again, probably not quite as much as you might expect for that regular cumulative growth over the course of that period of time. So we still haven't cracked the problem. We still haven't quite identified what's going to work. So we now need to look at contributing for as long as possible. And, and this is something that we've spoken about many times already today. Fortunately, legislation helps us hugely here. Now, we've got automatic enrolment putting people into pension schemes from age 22. So they're starting earlier than ever. We know that opt-out stats, opt-out rates are pretty low. You know, even in, in the lowest uh, age group, so under 30-year-olds, opt-out rates are less than 5%, according to, to stats from, from Nest. Across the whole uh, population, it's about 10%. So pensions are working at the moment. We don't know whether that will slip and that will shift when contribution minimums start to creep up over the course of the next couple of years, but we'll have to wait and see. At the other end of the spectrum, we've then got the default retirement age being removed. We've got state pension age creeping up. Now, so the, the length of time that people are saving is going to increase, which is fantastic. It's a, it's a huge help. So what if Jack started saving at 22 instead of 25? Three more years in his pension pot. Three more years to, to, to grow over, over the long term. Well, that's going to add £24,000 onto his 265. Again, it's not making a massive difference. All these things by themselves aren't really helping. So we get to the, the thorny issue of asking people to pay more in. And it is a thorny issue, particularly when you're asking staff who are already stretched 
to put their hands in their pocket, or you're asking an FD to do more to support a pension scheme. But these are the conversations we have to have. These are the, 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 the issues that we have to address. Because at the moment in the UK, there is a frighteningly massive disconnect between what people expect from their pension scheme and what it's probably actually going to deliver. And we've uh, gathered some research over the course of the past few months that show that the average expectation for income in retirement in the UK is £38,000. However, the average income received in retirement at the moment is £14,000. That's a massive gulf that needs to be addressed if, if people are going to be able to retire in the way that they wish. Now, we've got plenty of stats. I won't go through them in, in detail. You'll know what your average contribution to the pension scheme and your companies are. You'll know generally what your employees are paying into the pension scheme. What's, what's quite stark is when you look at how the employer rates generally have changed over the course of the past decade or so. Uh, you know, yes, we've moved away from, from DB to DC. We've seen the increase of uh, contributions uh, through automatic enrolment watering down these averages. But we've gone from a contribution rate from employers of about 11% back in 2000 to about 25 in 2015. So it's a massive drop in terms of that support from employers that, that we need to start to address, we need to start to think about. Because when we factor contributions into this picture, it, it makes quite a difference. So we base this on the 8% contribution, which will be familiar to many of you, based on that auto enrolment target of where we will be in April 2019 for that minimum statutory compliance. 5% from the employee, 3% from the employer if you're going to be doing the bare minimum. Well, what if we ask the employer to match one for one. So instead of it being a five and three, we get a five and five. And we get a 10% contribution going into the pension scheme from day one. Well, the impact that that has on the pension pot for Jack is quite considerable. We now get 66,000 pounds additional in his pension pot uh, over the course of that period of time for that extra 2% that have gone in. Uh, we're now seeing a real difference, a real value uh, to the increase of the benefit for that particular individual. Now this, though, isn't about picking the one thing that will make a difference. This isn't about taking a, a look at this and viewing this as a menu and choosing which one works best for you. My view very much is that this is about taking small steps, taking step changes in order to make a great leap. Because when you start to apply all of these together, you really do begin to see the overall benefit. So we started out with Jack projecting a pension pot of £265,000. If we then assume he started earlier, so he's now started from 22, we're now getting to a pension pot of 290. The next step is to reduce that charge, to negotiate with the, the provider to bring that charge down to the 0.5 that we saw at the beginning. And this is getting Jack's pension pot now to 309,000 pounds. We'll then make sure that you're in the right investment fund, taking the right amount of risk to deliver the right amount of return. And now Jack's pension pot is in excess of 350,000 pounds at retirement. And last, but certainly not least, we add in the contribution increase, making that up to the 10% with the, the one-for-one -one match from the employer, which sees Jack's pension pot increase by 66% over the course of this period of time through these small changes, these small changes delivering a real outcome for the future. It's fantastic to have heard people talk today about Save More Tomorrow, about stepped changes, about slow mo's work in the past, about what, what this should mean, because that's where we then see a massive difference. If you can tie in these step changes to a pay rise, to a salary review, so that the employee doesn't feel it, so that they are giving away money they've never had, the difference is staggering. So if we assume that Jack starts at 22, he has a five-year increment process so that by the time he reaches age 27, his employer is paying five, but he's now paying 10, his pension pot is considerably bigger. This is a good member outcome, a 141% increase on his pension contributions. That's a major difference to what you could have potentially seen before. So all of these things are important. You know, the charge is important, the investment is important, but contributions are the heart of what actually happens through the pension scheme. That's where the real growth comes. And that's why I've put this, this new mantra up here of 0 to 15 by 30. Getting people from a 0% contribution to a 15% contribution by age of 30. Uh, it's not easy, it's not attainable for many people, but that's not what a mantra should be. A mantra is something you aspire to reach, not something that everybody can easily achieve. So we've spoken about our seven friends at the beginning. We've, we've spoken at length about Jack and his situation and how we can improve that. But there's one character that we've missed so far from this particular story, and that's Snow White. Or, depending upon your views, the Wicked Queen. So we'll have to give that some thought. And, and you're, you're lucky you've got your, your opportunity to cast your own 
uh, comment on that, not just through Slido, but in the, the polling stations in a, a few weeks' time as to what, what, what part she will play in this. From my own perspective, the, the one outcome that I would love to see um, that we probably haven't had the chance to enjoy in the past decade or two is a period of political stability when it comes to legislation that recognises and puts pensions firmly at the heart of what employees need. Thank you. Fantastic. Many thanks, Gavin. Um, we've got time for one, maybe even two questions, if they're very short, so perhaps we can have the uh, Slido deck up. Um, you can see that. Okay, so <clears throat> top of this is an interesting one, actually. Uh, employer governance for contract-based schemes. Okay. Is it in fact effective? Yeah, so I actually saw this question pop up earlier again. It's yeah. a great, great to see it it's reappear because really it, yeah. it is so, so important. You know, governance of pension schemes, particularly in GPPs where you haven't got the trustee body doing the same amount of work and actually having that employer step up and taking the responsibility, building a group of people that can, can manage and monitor the scheme specifically for that workforce is, is absolutely important. We've got, we've got uh, provider IGCs that are doing the work on a, on a much, much higher level, but, but your governance of contract-based GPPs, in my view, is, is absolutely essential to success of schemes. That's great. And that actually links in a little bit with the, one of the other points here, um, was how open to negotiation are providers on charges? Well, given the conversation I had at lunchtime, um, fairly, <laughs> uh, I, I would suggest. Um, yeah, as long as you're presenting the right case, as long as you're presenting the right reasons for negotiation, yeah, they will want to retain assets. They will want to retain business. They do not want to see those assets that they've worked very hard to grow walking out of the door unnecessarily. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Thank you. And I think we've got time for one more here. So uh, what impact do you foresee when auto-enrolment contribution rates start to merge or even overtake typical DC rates? Yeah, the great unknown future. Uh, there's, there's a huge amount that we've got to concentrate on when we get through 2018 into 2019 and we start to see these contribution rates get up above and beyond where they are now. I think we will see a, an increase in opt-out rates. Um, whether or not we see uh, a return to the question of moving away from opt-outs and, and, and hard compulsion being part of the pension landscape is, is, is going to be very interesting to see. Yeah, no, well, we'll wait on that one with uh, bated breath. We will so indeed. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, Gavin. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you.